Welcome back to our daily walk, and we are going to continue in on our foundation study, and we are looking at book two today. Uh, so we're starting the book two, um, which is about the fall and redemption. And uh, so this first message out of this is actually going to be a two-parter because it's like four pages in notes. And uh, that's quite a bit. Um, and we're going to be talking about the fall, the fall of mankind. So, of course, we'll be spending some time in early Genesis as we work on this. And we're going to start out with Genesis 3-7. The eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loin coverings. So, of course, that's Adam and Eve after eating the tree of the knowledge of good and evil which they were commanded not to eat. And so proper study of mankind is found in the study of man, but the study of man is never complete without an understanding of the relationship between man and God. Okay, our self-knowledge helps us understand how we relate to God, but we also must understand God in terms of his own revelation uh, to us found in the word. So we need to understand what is the interplay between us and between God and, and everything else. That's kind of the, the important part. So we're going to look at, first we're going to look at a couple of philosophies. So two philosophies. Uh, our understanding in the fall can be understood by examining two con contrary views of mankind. So one of these is that the reason is the center of mankind, and the other is a mechanical view of mankind. So, first to look at the reason. Um, reason as the center of mankind. So this is a dominant worldview in the Gratio Roman world held by many of the classical philosophers, including Plato and Socrates. Okay, so we talk about different philosophies, modernism, rationalism. So we've talked about these before. Uh, but again, modernism believes that you can solve the world's problems through our intellect and our reasoning. So this was that big thing around the turn of the century, um, you know, in the 1900s, Industrial Revolution, the turn of the century showed up. And then what happened is, is people would start to believe that by the power of our intellect, that we could actually solve the world world's problems. We could solve disease. We could solve world hunger. And in many as aspects, we did solve some of those things. Okay, now rationalism, we learn through our philosophical senses apart from a diver uh, divine source. So prior to modernism taking root, people would believe in the external revelation from a god is the central view and then with rationalism we start to cast aside everything that was potentially outside the scope of our own physical senses and so a lot of our scientific and discoveries and endeavors are based upon our own personal scientific thoughts and observations okay and so rationalism and modernism are are very closely intertwined Okay, but there is a problem with these views and that it, it defies reason and mankind's own decision making. Okay, so what we mean by that is this creates a dualistic approach to life where the mind is the deity and the body is the flesh. So what this means is that our, our thoughts, our actions, our emotions can and oftentimes are deceptive. Now, we have moved beyond this into a feeling where we don't even think about our intellect anymore. Now we're to the point where we just use our feelings to guide us, and that's infinitely more dangerous. Uh, but we're going to cover that another time. All right. Um, and so the reason approach asserts that man is generally good because man is reason and reason is good. Therefore, man is good. You know, it's a post hoc argument. Um, and that's one of those views that we have to take in mind. Um, and, and this is kind of, uh, this, is, this is something that we find oftentimes where we'll see and hear statements like, you know, people are, are in general just good people. And in reality, um, all aspects of us have been touched by the fall. So all of us have those elements of evil, but all of us also are created in the image of God. And so we have an element of good. And so for people who are, are more in tune with the element of the creation of God and look to mankind and say, we want to support other mankind 
in those people, we find a lot of general good. But people who are inherently more selfish then these people, they're generally not in favor of, of God, you know, and, and, and the better, better element. So basically what this means is that taking the reason as the center of mankind actually denies the element of human sin. Okay, it denies the element of human sin. Um, so the problem is the root is a, not a question of education. Um, in fact, I remember when I was in, in grad school and I was uh, mentoring this undergrad student in a research project and he was telling me about, you know, one of his classes was the debate team and, and uh, the topic they had to discuss is should we lower the alcohol drinking age to 18 or is it okay at 21 or, you know, so, so it's like, you know, what do you think the problem is? And this, this young man was not a believer or anything and he says, you know, we just need more education. And I walked him through a whole lot of fascinating things going, well, you know what's right and wrong. And he's like, oh yeah, I know this. He says, do you still do stuff? Well, well yeah. I'm like, why? You're educated enough. You know, people are educated enough not to cheat on their wives. They still do. People are educated enough the dangers of drugs and addictions and, and problems, and we still get caught up in them. Education is not the key. It is not a question of education or how frequently, <laughs> um, you know, how frequently do we do things we know we must not. It's not an, an, a, circum, uh, a question of circumstance. Okay, it is more important how we react to a situation than the situation we find ourselves. So the, the reality is we are emotional creatures who, as a general heart of who we are, we tend to gravitate towards the bad. Now, it's not intrinsically all bad that we gravitate toward. Uh, that's one of those things to keep in mind, that some of us will simply not fall in some areas, but some of us will simply greatly fall in others, and that is, is something to keep in mind. So the rational faculty is important, and the faculty is inherited from the divine. Okay, we are created in the image of God, and part of that is our ability to rationalize and to reason and to think and to create. That is an element from God. That is denied to animals, but itself it is not divine. Okay, some people talk about us being gods ourselves. That is not true. So that is the, the philosophy of the reason as the center of mankind. The second is the mechanical view of mankind, the mechanical view. So in the mechanical view, we are merely biological creatures. We are devoid of any spirituality, and our body dictates our destiny. Um, behind this was the, the purifying of, of the bad people that we might see in, in the cases of like, you know, what happened in, in the Stalin era and the Nazi era where they're trying to purify the, you know, get the impurities out of the human race, breed them out, cast them out, do whatever else it takes to get those impurities out of the human race. That is what they had in mind. They had a mechanical view in mind. They didn't take the rational view. The rational view wants to preserve all those people because if you're just killing people off based upon their, their, their gender or their, or their race or whatever else, if you just do that, well, you could very well be killing the guy who comes up with the next, uh, the next viewpoint. So the the you know evil nations of of the world's past were not taking the the reason view; they were taking the mechanical view, the biological view that simply said what we need to do is cast out, cast out um, uh, the impurities. That's what they wanted to do. Okay, <clears throat> so this was indeed extracted from two views, Darwinism. It is well known that the entire concept of, of you know, Nietzsche was built on Darwinism. The, the, they complement one another, and that was the philosophy that was taken by, by Stalin and by Hitler. Um, these things said that we are biologically evolved and adapted to our environment due to response and environmental factors. So how do you make a perfect race? You get rid of the impurities. And that was the, the view. And of course, Marxism is the other root of that. Um, the history of how we relate to the world is based on fixed set of economics. We behave a certain way because we are merely programmed to behave that way. So basically, this, this uh, mechanical view of man, it, we are either adapted this way by our environment 
or we are made this way by the economic influences of the world. Darwinism or Marxism, both of these tie into the mechanical view of man. Of course, in our modern day, as we're starting to see a resurgence of a lot of conspiracy theories, it is the economic, the Marxist view that seems to uh, to be become premanent in, in the views that say, well, well, we are just controlled by an upper elite. Uh, that is a very Marxist way to approach it versus other people would just say, well, if we're just random collisions, well, you'd take a more Darwin, Darwinist approach. And uh, the, the conspiracy theories surrounding, you know, the Rockefellers and their eugenics tend to focus more on that Marxist type of view of mankind. Both of those are wrong. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if we're oppressed by an elite because there's an ultimate God who the elite is accountable to. And if no amount of power and no amount of wealth could possibly get them off the hook of that. And God knows their hearts, and God knows their motives, and God knows their actions, should they exist. So, the reality is, though, both of these philosophies have problems and challenges. We'll go get into those in a minute. <clears throat> uh, the biological view, basically man is merely a highly evolved animal, and we are forced by our environment to behave in predetermined ways. So this is akin to what is called genetic determinism. If you've ever read the book Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, Stephen Covey has an entire section in one of the chapters dealing with determinism. And determinism is basically a, a viewpoint that says, well, I do this because that's how I am. That's the mechanical view of man at hard work. And Stephen Covey is actually denying determinism, saying get over that. Get over your past family. If you came from a bad and abusive, dysfunctional family, once you've acknowledged that, you are now in the position to set that aside and to move forward. Don't say, we've always been screwed up, so we always will be screwed up. You're adopting the mechanical view of man, and there's a problem with that. So don't accept genetic determinism or economic determinism or any other determinism. Stop where you are right now, figure out where you are, and move ahead. That's what we should be doing. <clears throat> so let's look at the problems with these two views of man. So like most things, the truth is somewhere in the middle. Shocking. All right, so daily we fight with two negative views of our humanity. Number one is that the mind can free us. This gets to that that education. Education is the way to do it. And this is where American and Western culture is rife with this. We just believe that we can overcome the problems of the world merely with more education, more education, and more education. And we can educate ourselves into mere imbecility because no amount of education is going to overcome the inherent nature that we have inside of ourselves to merely sin. And we have to acknowledge the sin. Acknowledging the sin is the first step to overcoming the sin. That what is the first step of Alcoholics Anonymous? I am powerless over my addiction. That is the point. Okay, so we have this view of mind can free us with more education, with better reasoning, and more time I can solve my own problems. Another view, uh, another one of the two negative views is this is how I am. I am forever doomed to be this way and I cannot possibly change. Those are those two approaches we tend to take. So only Christianity can explain the natural and the logical outpouring of both views. And only Christianity can overcome the two challenges. That's it. Okay. We sense we are more than just matter. We have this inherent thing inside of us. This is one of those things that C.S. Lewis just could not get over. One of those things that drove him to see that God is that we are not merely random collisions. We have more of that. We sense a connection with the divine because we are created. We are created in the image of God. And being created in the image of God, we have this connection to him. And the third is we sense our connection to divine is missing something. We know we're more than just random chance. We know there's a God, but we're missing something. And that's what we need to dive into. 
So what we're going to do here is we're going to dig through some scripture. That's an overview of philosophy. Uh, now we're going to actually dig through some scripture, and we are going to look at a couple of things. And uh, we're only going to cover uh, one more of these in this lesson, and then we're going to cover the rest of these. So the things that we're going to cover, we are going to look at unfaithfulness of the human race. We're going to look at the rebellion of the human race. We're going to look at pride of the human race and the general conclusions of the fall. So uh, for this, the remainder of this lesson, we're going to be looking at the unfaithfulness of the human race. So um, in Genesis 1, 26 uh, to 31, it says, Then God said, Let us make man in our image according to our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and the cattle and over all of the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. And God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them. And God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth, and subdue it, and rule over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the sky, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And then God said, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the surface of all the earth, and every tree which has fruit yielding seeds, it shall, it shall be food for you. And to every beast of the earth, and to every bird of the sky, and to everything that moves on the earth which has life, I have given every green plant for food, and it was so. And God saw all that he had made, and it was good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. Okay, so in the beginning, when Adam and Eve were in the Garden of Eden, they had almost total freedom. They had one restriction. Do not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Okay, but in chapter 2, verses 15 and 17, here is that one restriction. That one restriction, they had total freedom except for this one restriction. The Lord God told the man and put him in the garden of Eden to cultivate it and keep it. And the Lord commanded the man, saying, From the, any tree of the garden you may eat freely, but from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day you eat of it you will surely die. One restriction. Stay away from that one tree. In fact, it wasn't just to stay away. It was merely don't eat it. You could touch it. You could look at it. Probably advisable not to. Um, but that was the one command. Do not eat of that tree. And that's actually important to keep in mind that God said do not eat of the tree. Okay, what was the tree? What was the tree? This has caused some discussion. A lot of people talk about the tree being an apple. Was it an apple? Well, that's what's commonly thrown out. But there's no biblical justification, but this is certainly the most common. Some people say it was grapes, um, and the sin was making wine. Some people have actually said that. Not likely due to the general, general neutral prevalence of wine in the Bible. So the people who might want to take on that view are those people that are overly religious about not consuming wine or alcohol. And the reality is, um, while there are certainly some decent cases for not drinking wine uh, and alcohol, especially in our culture where it tends to cause more problems than good, we don't have a specific forbiddance of drinking alcohol. And, you know, Christ drank alcohol. Paul tells Timothy, drink a little bit of alcohol. Of course, the wine in those days wasn't nearly, you know, like moonshine now. Um, and certainly we have restrictions against drunkenness. Absolutely. I agree with that. Um, but uh, there's no evidence that, that this was that this was um, wine, especially since it's well known and scripturally even that wine comes, you know, wine and grapes come from a vine, not from a tree. So I would reject that. Um, some people talk about this tree as a symbolic thing. There are some very prudish Christian groups that say that this is symbolic of sex, commonly found in the popular media, uh, interpreting sexual uh, faithfulness as Christian prudishness. So if you watch, in fact, uh, Eric Holmberg noted uh, in his hell, uh, knows his uh, Pandora's box office series, you know, he says if if a marriage is is seen in a Hollywood production, it usually signifies the end of romance. Okay, and Hollywood tends to to breed on the unfaithfulness, but look at any degree of faithfulness 
as prudishness. And it's really the devil's done a really good job of really crazily redefining things. This is not biblical because we have the mandate in scripture to be fruitful and multiply, and that means sex. And that even comes in Genesis 1.28. It says, God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over every little living thing that moves on the earth. And that seems to be a condition and a commandment given to them before the fall. So obviously it's not that. Uh, so the exact fruit is unknown, but the symbolism we understand well. We depend on God and whether the command is great or small, we are always tested in our obedience to God. We're always tested in our obedience to God. That, in fact, is what I wrote in the book Testing and Temptations, which is specifically about um, specifically about sanctification, the process. What is the difference between being tested by God and a temptation? What is the difference in that? And that is uh, that is one of those things that that I I've always you know wanted to study. We have we are oftentimes given tests from God, and we are tested as to our faithfulness to those. Okay, so the temptation from Satan likely occurred quickly, but we don't know for sure. Um, and certainly it was before Adam and Eve had their first child. We, we, that seems to be supported well. Um, uh, but, uh, we do know it was, it was pretty easy. So next let's talk about the method of Satan's attack. Okay. Satan did not attack God right away. He used a line of questioning to make Eve questioned God herself. This is what makes God and the, you know, or not God, but the, the devil and, and Satan so, uh, so deceptive is that he doesn't come out and just teach us. The objective is to ask us questions that make us question our own motivations. And this is a dangerous thing because this is oftentimes what's behind a lot of the more subversive messages we get out of Hollywood. It's, uh, it's to, to get us to question things. So I knew a guy who was, uh, back before it was, uh, back before it was uh, a big and a popular and, and an accepted thing to be gay. I knew a guy, in fact, he, he even said, I am, I'm not gay. I'm undefined. Um, no, <laughs> you're gay. He could finally admit he was gay after he knew, you know, one particular guy and he finally come out and say, I am gay. But he was always trying to get me to, to watch movies and whatever else. He was big into movies and Hollywood stuff. And he was always trying to get me to question these presuppositions. And so, you know, and I was, I was fairly young at the time. So, um, he gives me this movie, The Crying Game. If you've ever watched The Crying Game, I probably encourage you not to. Um, but in The Crying Game, the entire purpose of the movie, and if I remember correctly, it was written in 1989. If I remember correctly, I might be wrong on that date. But, of course, homosexuality was not a, a popular thing in the culture then. It was still taboo. And the entire purpose of the movie, without going into the whole plot, is to cause the viewer to question, can a person truly love somebody and does what's in their pants matter? And it was an entire movie, it was one of the first movies to come down and cause people to question those things. And that is how the devil works. He's not going to come right out and teach us and lecture us. He gets us to question our own presuppositions. In this case, he gets Eve to question God himself. So look at, um, look at the command again. We're going to read the command again into... Um, uh, it is 2.17, Genesis 2.17. But from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat it, for in the day that you eat from it, you will surely die. So with that being said, what was the command? Don't eat it. Look at what the devil said in Genesis 3.3. 3. Um, so, well, actually, let's just go ahead and look at, at uh, one. Let's look at Genesis 3, 1 through uh, one through three. The serpent was more crafty than any beast of the field, which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, indeed, has God said, you shall not eat from any tree in the garden. And the woman said to the serpent, from the fruit of the trees of the garden, we may eat. But from the fruit of the tree, which is in the middle of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat from it or touch it or you will die. So with 
De- the, with the devil asking this question, he says, has God said you shall not eat from any tree in the garden? That's an important distinction. That's Genesis 3, 1. The devil says, did God say you can't eat from anything? Eve said, no, no, no. We can eat from everything except the one. What's behind the question is to get us to ask ourselves that question, what is up with that one tree? Do you see that Eve, in verse 3, added to God's command. All God said is don't eat it. Eve says, from the fruit of the trees in the garden we may eat, but from the fruit of the tree in the middle of the garden, God has said you shall not eat from it or touch it, lest you die. And of course, Eve added that. Because the devil got Eve through the questioning to question God himself. And so she added it, making God seem even more restrictive than he was. So Satan then attacked the specific part of the command, you will surely die. He doesn't question anything else. He attacks that one specific part, starting in verse 4, verses 4 and 5. The servant said to the woman, You surely will not die, for God knows on the day you eat from it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good from evil. Okay, so what's behind this now is that Eve is now being questioning, the devil is, is questioning Eve's interpretation of God and what he says. So Eve is already questioning God. The devil sees that in his response because the devil knew what God's commandment was. He twisted around intentionally to get Eve to question it intentionally. That's what he thought. That's what what was in mind there. All right. So Eve is questioning God. So Satan convinces her that all of his commands are indeed false. So the purpose of the temptation was not to get Eve to eat the forbidden fruit, which is probably why it is not identified. It is so that Eve questions the total of God's commands. Right? So ultimately, sin is unfaithfulness to the clear commands of God. That is what the most important part of this is. Okay, so again, with the devil already getting Eve to question our commandments, you know, how we learn and understand and obey God, then the devil wants us to question everything about him. The temptation wasn't just to eat the fruit. The temptation was to get us to question God himself. So that's the important part. So we're actually going to stop this one here. Um, And then next time we're going to pick up on rebellion and finish out the rest of these. So uh, thanks for coming along to uh, learn about the fall. And I hope that's not not too crazy out of the way, but I want to give people a lot more. If you're new to this channel, and I know this is a growing channel, so it's going to be a lot of new folks watching this. Um, If you're new to the channel, I try and do a whole lot more depth than you find at a lot of other places. And so... We're going to go ahead and uh, end this out in prayer, and we'll have a few final concluding remarks. Uh, So God, we thank you so much that uh, you've given us your word, Lord, and that uh, while we fell in the garden and uh, through Adam, uh, that original sin is passed down through us, and we seek that disobedience, Lord. We ask that you would show us our sin, because in showing us our sin is the very first step. And once we can admit that we are powerless over our sin, Lord, and that we can believe that Jesus Christ has come and died for our sins, and we can confess our sins to you, Lord, that is what it takes to truly, truly become a member of your family, Lord. And we thank you for the salvation you granted us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, if, uh, if you do need help in your Christian walk and you uh, need to get a hold of someone, feel free to shoot me a comment there. I do try and read all the comments. Um, so that is, um, uh, that is what you can do. Shoot me a message there. Um, once again, I do have a couple books. If you would like to help support the channel, you can. Um, I actually, I have an Amazon Associates account that you can you can use as well. If you shop on Amazon at all, you can use that link, and the link is down below. That will actually help support what we do. 
Um, I also have some books available. I've already talked about Testing and Temptations. Uh, this is a book about the, uh, the basic process of sanctification. I have a few more of these left in the office to sell. I will be eventually uh, redoing this as a, in a new edition. Um, but my other book is called The Art of Shallow Neighboring, and this is actually a parody of First World Christianity, particularly looking at the book The Art of Neighboring, uh, which several of the churches in my town decided to go through <laughs> this last year. And uh, I read the book several times, and uh, it was uh, not the best Christian book out there, so I decided to parody it. Um, so with those being said... Um, there are other ways you can help support the uh, what we're doing here as well. Check out ourwalkinchrist.com forward slash support to figure out those. And uh, do let us know if you need some help or some guidance in your early Christian walk. We would uh, be glad to reach out. So thanks for watching, and I hope that you enjoy your daily walk with our Lord.